I'll come back. The Local Initiative Support Corporation, commonly known as LISC, was created in 1979 to connect residents and local institutions with the capital, strategy, and know-how to help revive their struggling communities. Today, LISC is one of the largest organizations supporting projects that revitalizes under-resourced communities and bring greater economic opportunity to residents. LISC has offices in over 30 cities, including one right here in Indianapolis, where it works to transform distressed communities and neighborhoods into healthy ones. Maurice Jones took, helm, took the helm of as LISC's fourth president and CEO in 2016 and brought with him a career's worth of business, management and policy experience, but perhaps most important, a lifetime commitment to improving communities and the lives of low-income Americans. Raised by his grandparents on their tobacco farm in rural Virginia, Jones knows firsthand the challenges that face, uh, that face many under-resourced communities and has spent his career working to find solutions. With the encouragement of his family and teachers, Jones attended Hampton Sydney College, a private liberal arts college for men in Virginia, on a full merit scholarship and was selected as a Rhodes Scholar. This enabled him to earn a master's degree in international relations at Oxford University. From there, he went on to earn his, new, his law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law. Prior to joining LISC, Maurice uh, served as the Secretary of uh, Commerce for the Commonwealth of Virginia, where he managed 13 state agencies focused on the economic needs of his home state. Additionally, he served as Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and was Commissioner of Virginia's Department of Social Services and Deputy Chief of Staff to former Virginia Governor Mark Warner. LISC celebrates their 40th anniversary just a few weeks ago, celebrated their 40th anniversary just a few weeks ago, and during those four decades, they have been a powerful force of positive change in communities all across the community, country. Please join me in welcoming LISC President and CEO Maurice A. Jones to the stage. Thank you, sir. Good to have you here. Yeah, nice to be with you. Well, good afternoon. good afternoon. That was okay. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, all right. Well, it's nice to be with you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor, for that kind introduction. Um, I hail from Virginia, and I am um, the father of a 16-year-old daughter. And so in my house, it's my wife, my daughter, and me, in that order. <laughs> so this morning, my daughter and I have this uh, ritual. No matter where I am, uh, she calls me as she is taking the bus to school. And you know, we tell one another that we love one another. Um, and this morning, I said, uh, well, Sweet Pea, her name is Michaela, but you know, she'll always be Sweet Pea to me, right? <laughs> I said, Sweepy Daddy's going to talk at lunch. Um, you got any um, ideas for Daddy? She's a 16-year-old sophomore getting ready to think about college or already thinking about it. I said, you got any thoughts for Daddy? And she paused and she said, Daddy, it really doesn't matter what you talk about. She said, just don't talk too long. <laughs> That's the way it goes in my house. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm happy uh, to be with you. Uh, I understand the club was started around 1974, uh, and so I'm, I'm happy to, to be in your midst. Um, I do want to, on behalf of LISC, just at the outset, and I won't be, I'll, forgive me, because I'm sure I'll leave some folks out, but we have a lot of supporters and friends uh, in the audience. Uh, the Lilly Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase, we've got members of our local board here, uh, Central Indiana Community Foundation, we've got 
a former Lisk CEO, Sherry Seiward. Did I get that right? See, that's pretty good for me. I practice that, by the way, a lot. Um, Bill Taft, where's Dr. Taft, our former CEO here, who was CEO for quite some time. He had hair when he started, <coughs> but hair is overrated. Uh, we, <laughs> Na neighborhood partners like the Bonner Center and Edna Martin Christian Center, the Flanner House, uh, Mapleton Fall Creek CDC, the city, the Chamber, United Way, PNC Commerce Bank, Old National Bank, and the list goes on. I want to, on behalf of all of LISC, say thank you to all of our partners in Indianapolis, and uh, I also want to say Let's keep trying to do big things together. So thank you all. Let me do that. Just like. um, it was mentioned that, how, how many know LISC, by the way? I just want to, oh, yeah, this is an easy crowd. Um, our headquarters are in New York. We've got 35 offices around the country. Now, don't tell anybody I said this but the best office is right here in Indianapolis. And so I do want to make sure I especially recognize Ted Grain and the current LISC team. Thank you all. Where are you? There you go. I see you. Now don't tell the others I said that. Um, so 35 offices. Uh, just to give you some headlines, uh, LISC in 40 years uh, has invested $20 billion in low and moderate income communities primarily all around the country. Uh, in addition to the 35 offices, uh, we have 90 partners in rural America, two of which are here uh, in your great state that we work with to do community development work in rural America also. So we've invested in every state uh, in the union. And we are actually, last point on LISC, we are actually a family of four community development companies. Uh, we've got the, what we call core LISC, which I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, but we also have the largest nonprofit syndicator of the low income housing tax credit, which still in this country is the largest federal incentive for affordable housing development and, and uh, preservation in the country. We have, a, we have the largest syndicator of the new markets tax credit. Uh, and then lastly, we started at the end of last year a small business lending company that we call Emito, uh, which is for those of you who are not classics or didn't study the classics, it's Latin to launch is what it means. Now, don't blame me, but we misspelled it. <laughs> we spell it with one T. The correct spelling is two Ts. And the reason why we spelled it with one T is someone had already patented the, or had trademark on the two Ts. Uh, but it still means the same thing. Um, so let me share a little bit. I spend most of my time uh, as the CEO of a company that has 35 offices and that works in every state. I spend, I spend most of my time traveling from state to state um, and from city to city. And there are some themes that you see that I uh, want to share with you. The first, the overall theme is and this is urban, rural, this is north, south, east, west. There is great talent in every corner of the country. We do not lack for talent. The challenge is opportunity. Opportunity for that talent to flourish and develop. I am reminded of a poem that I believe T.S. Eliot wrote somewhere in the 50s, where he was lamenting what he thought was the population's turn away from God. 
uh, and the populations drifting in despair. And he wrote a poem, and I think the poem was called The Choruses from the Rock, where he has lines in it which basically say, um, he, he's saying, what are people doing um, uh, as they're turning away from God? And he says that we are dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. Well, here is a news flash for you today. Our system is not perfect much less so perfect that no one will need to be good. And so let me tell you about some of the big problems that we're seeing that need to be solved that we're seeing all over the country. In no particular order, uh, the first is economic mobility. The ability of someone born in poverty to actually get out of that impoverished state somewhere doing his or her lifetime. That was the American dream. That is the American dream. That you can, in this country, be born in a log cabin and become president, or be born in Hope, Arkansas and become president. I'm not being political, by the way, just giving you illustrations. Well, let's look right here in Indianapolis. Right now, according to data that the Chetty Group did, and I think this study was back in 2015 or 2016, an individual born in Indianapolis in the lower 20th percentile of wealth and income has less than a 5% chance of escaping that, well, getting into the top 20th percentile during his or her lifetime. Indianapolis ranks 48th amongst the top 50 cities in the country in economic mobility. And that's amidst a city that has a thriving economy, amongst the lowest unemployment that you've experienced in two decades. You've got Salesforce hiring 800 to 1,000 people. You've got amongst the healthiest healthcare industries in the country. You're still vibrant with manufacturing. The list goes on, right? Dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will need to be good. We've got to be good to get better at that economic mobility list. I don't think you want to be 48th on the list, right? Am I, tell me if I'm wrong. We, we were invited into Charlotte, North Carolina to open an office there because Charlotte is 50th on that list. The headquarters of some of the major banks in the country is 50th. So economic mobility is one of the problems that we're seeing all over the country. A second one that I'll put out there for you by the way, I'm going to come back and try to give some solutions. <laughs> Life expectancies. So um, I went to school for a while in England. And I think the English still do this. You get on the tube, as they call it, and you go from stop to stop. And when you get to a stop in England, this wonderful voice comes on the, uh, through the speakers and says, you're now at, you know, whatever crossings, mind the gap. 
Well, when I was a student, I used to think that was the coolest thing. I would just get on the tube and ride from stop to stop just to hear that repeated, mind the gap. Mind the gap, right? I just thought that is so British, right? In, the, in, in this country, we would say, don't trip when you get off. Right? That's what we would say, don't trip when you get off, because we don't care whether you hurt yourself or not, but we don't want you to hurt somebody else. They say, mind the gap. We've got some significant gaps of peril in this country. I was in Boston yesterday, and the poorest census tract in Boston compared to the wealthiest census tract has a life expectancy gap of 33 years. 33 years. Well, guess what? You have life expectancy gaps as well. Not quite 33 years. The largest I saw was about 14 years. 14 year life expectancy gap, literally 20 minutes away. Again, I'm going to come back to this. This has nothing to do or very little to do with the care that people are getting within the clinical walls. This has much more to do with the conditions that people are living in day to day. 14-year life expectancy. You are in the midst of uh, still one of the most thriving manufacturing economies in the country. Um, and so I commend you for that. You're still making things. Um, it's terrific. The country right now has a huge middle skills competency gap whereby 50, in some cases, 60% of the jobs in many of our businesses are jobs that need post-secondary education. They need the right license. They need the right certification, whether it's welding or whether it's healthcare technology, whether it's automotive technology, you name it. And employers can't find it. And so you've got hundreds of thousands of jobs going unfilled that, by the way, pay good wages. And they're unfilled largely because we don't have enough people getting those post-secondary certifications and licenses that we need. This is a threat to our economy. It's a threat to your local economy. Let me put one more theme on the table and then come back to it. Everywhere we go, in every city that we work in, race is an issue. Some people are uncomfortable talking about it. Some people are uncomfortable wrestling with it and acknowledging it. But racial disparities are present in every city where we work. Those places that are facing it head on, acknowledging it, and intentionally trying to do something about it are healing while they're working. I mentioned I was in Boston yesterday. Boston's Federal Reserve Bank did a study, and they looked at the net worth of white families and the net worth of black families. We'll get this headline. This is another list you don't want to be on. The net worth of white families in Boston, $247,000.
the net worth of black families in Boston, eight, eight dollars. There is no way that Boston will be able to maintain the vibrant, robust economy that it has if it doesn't close that gap. The fastest growing segments of the Boston population are people of color. I was looking for your net worth numbers. You were hiding them from me. <laughs> but I scrambled this morning, and I picked up a few data points. Let me see if I can find them and give them to you right. And if I got them wrong, it was because Ted gave me the wrong information. <laughs> <laughs> we think that directionally this is right, that the net worth of white families in Indy is somewhere about 126,000. And the net worth, bless you, of black families is somewhere about 9,000. Much better than Boston, but still not healthy. Um, we know that the median hourly wages between black and white families in the city are departing. Uh, median uh, wage for white families is somewhere around $20 an hour, and for black families it's $15 an hour, and that gap is actually going in the opposite direction. It's getting larger point is, without belaboring it, great cities are facing up to issues that they have around race and culture. And those that are not are going to be left behind. Every place where we work, including Indianapolis, you can highlight where race was used intentionally to discourage or discriminate and harm people, where highways were driven through um, prosperous neighborhoods of African Americans and others, where people were isolated based on race. We didn't get here through a, uh, a system that just happened organically, and we won't get out of here unless we're intentional about focusing on our people of color communities. Enough preaching on that one. So let me... Let me talk about um, what we are seeing, and you'll keep me on track time-wise. Am I good? Yeah? Because I just got started. This is like an appetizer. I remember what your daughter said. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? Man, I thought y'all were friendly and warm. <laughs> we, um, our uh, framework for helping communities to create more and more opportunity for more and more folks, focuses really on four themes. Focusing on people, focusing on places, building and sustaining healthy for-profit and not-for-profit enterprises, and making changes to the system that can ensure that more people are benefiting from growth. So people, places, enterprises, and systems. That's where we focus our, uh, our attention. In the people arena, we have a particular desire to work on this issue of getting more folks from our neighborhoods prepared with credentials that employers will pay good money for. Right? So we have, for example, um, 
four Bridges to Career Opportunity Centers, financial opportunity centers here in Indianapolis. Uh, they are designed to do three things to help people with financial literacy. By the way, it's a coaching model. You come into a financial opportunity center, you get a coach. The coach helps you get a budget. That budget shows you a lot of things. Most importantly, what debts you need to wrestle to the ground. Usually, folks from the neighborhoods that we're working in are working under debts that they need to retire. But that coach also is helping you to get a credit score for the first time or enhance your credit score so you can continue on a journey uh, that hopefully leads to a relationship with a traditional financial institution and hopefully at some point home ownership. Uh, but financial literacy is the first leg that we, um, we try to push. The second piece is working on those things that you need to get done in order to be a productive worker. You know what they are. Child care, housing, transportation, accessing their earned income tax credit. That coach serves as the facilitator to help you wrestle with that. And then lastly is the hard and soft skills. Uh, and what we like to do is to prepare folks for opportunities in certain industries that are paying livable wages and where their jobs. We've got four of these centers in neighborhoods. We use neighborhood-based organizations. We don't operate them. We invest in them to help them do this work and to do it at a level of excellence. We've got four here right now. We need to grow that number. There's no question about it. The opportunity to be of more service to the people in this great city is right in front of us. You've got an incredible array of job opportunities. We got to pre prepare the talent uh, to take advantage of them. And by the way, We've evaluated these centers. We know that they enhance net income. We know that they actually can help people get into a pathway for livable wages. In addition to that, on the people side, we're funding schools and charter schools and child care centers, et cetera. In the place arena, what we are trying to do there is basically, through real estate, help areas improve. You've got uh, what we call here Great Places 2020, of which we have five neighborhoods that we're focusing on. And we're trying through our capital, through our technical assistance, uh, through our expertise to build places in the city that are centers of housing and commerce and play. And so we're investing in repositioning real estate for businesses. We're investing in small businesses coming to, into neighborhoods and setting up shop and employing people. Those are the kinds of things uh, that we're doing. Supporting businesses, for-profit and not-for-profit, we're trying to, is the third leg. We're trying to provide grants, technical assistance, and other capital, uh, equity and loans to be helpful in thriving neighborhoods, thriving cities need a thriving for-profit and a thriving non-for-profit uh, um, system. And then the last thing for us is actually working on the systems. I had slides, but you know what? I've, I've changed my mind on whether I'm going to use them. But let me give you an example of systems innovation. In Washington, D.C., we are working on the, in the eastern part of the city, um, helping folks there who are wrestling largely with gentrification and its displacement connected with that. I got five minutes. Displacement connected with that gentrification. And there, what we're doing is um, through public policy, we worked with tenants to get a law passed through the city that says this, if you're an owner of an apartment building in an area 
that is gentrifying and thus your values are going up and you want to sell, you have to first offer to sell to the tenants. So the tenants have first right of refusal. Those tenants, by the way, have been living in these apartment buildings for 20 years, for 25, it's their home. Now, in addition to that, we are helping the tenants organize and we're making loans to the tenants associations so they can purchase the buildings. And there are other things, the bottom line is, that is a way that we're changing or attempting to change the system so that it works better for folks who are at all levels uh, of, um, of the economic journey. Three things that, uh, or two things that I want to share, and then I'm going to get out of the way so I don't go over my five minutes. The biggest new line of work that we have is what we're calling social determinants of health work. Now, social determinants of health, pretty simple stuff, right? 80% of the determinants of how healthy you are and how healthy the community is is not the care that you're getting from the doctor, right? It is, do you have a job that will enable you to pay your bills so that you're not living under stress that's causing your high blood pressure to rise? It is, do you have adequate recreation facilities in your neighborhood so that you can get exercise uh, and you're eating right so that obesity and diabetes are something that you're fighting through your neighborhood. It is, uh, are you living in housing that's healthy such that you don't have a risk of developing asthma because of bad paint or other contaminants in your home? Those are the primary determinants of whether we're healthy or not. The doctors treat you when you're sick, and boy, do we need them. What we're trying to do is to make sure you don't get sick. The primary determinants of that are outside of the clinical walls. So we are now, we committed to spend $10 billion in the next 10 years working with healthcare enterprises on healthy housing on jobs in the neighborhood, on getting people prepared to go to work at wages that will allow them to pay their bills, on creating recreation opportunities so kids and, and adults can play, can exercise, on those things that are the biggest determinants of the, whether you're healthy or not. We're looking to do that right here in Indianapolis. You have five healthcare systems here. Am I, am I, did I get the number right somewhere along that line? We're coming after you. You know who you are. We need your partnership to do the kind of work that goes upstream to help us build healthier neighborhoods in the city. That's number one and we are going to put capital on the table. $10 billion, don't tell the other 34 places, but I'll spend it all right here in Indianapolis if we can, if we've got the opportunity. Like I said, don't tell the others I said that. Um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to mention is more and more what you're seeing around the country are people putting together special purpose funds to work on a particular problem. So we're managing a $500 million fund for housing, affordable housing in the Bay Area. Uh, I, I joke with people all the time, $500 million in the Bay gets you two units of housing. <laughs> but that's not the point, that's not the point. That fund is being financed by, we're putting 50 million in it, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is putting 40 million in it, the philanthropic community from uh, the, the San Francisco Foundation to the Silicon Valley Foundation, Genentech is putting five, it is Kaiser Permanente is putting $40 million in it. 
The point is you got a community owning a problem and doing something about it in the private sector. We're going to work in collaboration with the public sector, but this fund is completely private sector financed. We're doing funds like that for business development. We've got an Entrepreneurs of Color Fund in Chicago. We're doing these special purpose funds. We're managing them all over the country. That is an opportunity here. I used to work in Washington, D.C. I was the deputy secretary at HUD. Every morning I would get up and go running. I hate running. <laughs> I will confess that. But I was being cheap. I didn't want to join the Y. Now, I'm a Y member now if the Y is in this audience. I love the Y. <laughs> they taught my daughter to swim. Um, but I remember the first day I got up and I went running, and there was a bus stop in front of me. And as I got closer to the bus stop, I realized there was a homeless guy in the bus stop. And I ran up to the bus stop, and as I got up to the bus stop, I ran in place right there in front of it because there was a traffic light there, and the homeless guy who had all his possessions with him looked up at me and he said in disgust, is that the best you can do? <laughs> and then he turned his back. I ran on. Next day, there he was. Next day, there he was. I developed uh, a friendship with this homeless guy. Let's call him Howard for, for purposes of this discussion. Uh, and I learned that he had been homeless in Baltimore and Philly, and now he was in D.C. Um, I learned that he, under no conditions, would go into a shelter. Um, I learned a lot of other things uh, about him. I remember after three months or so, I ran, and there he was, and he looked up at me and he said, you're doing better, you're doing better. That was April when I started. One December morning, when it was below freezing, I got up and went about my run, and when I came to that bus stop, Howard was not there. I never saw him again. I never saw Howard again. I don't know whether he went to Richmond, moved further south because it got cold. I don't know whether he elected to go into a shelter. I also don't know whether or not he died from frostbite. Remember that 16-year-old daughter? Here's what I know. If she had been the person in that bus stop the first day, that would have been her last day at that bus stop. I would have stopped the world and found shelter for her. No question in my mind about that. That's what we need in the country. All the other stuff that I'm talking about is good stuff. And we need capital stacks. We need money. We need people who know how to do housing. We need people who know how to work and cure diabetes or work on a cure. But what we need more than anything else is the ability for all of us to see in the face of every homeless person, every Howard, the face of our loved ones. That's what we need to really transform the country. And I'm naive enough to believe that though my heart failed me when it came to Howard, that we, me, and others can get to a place where everybody in need is someone that we see a relative or the face of a relative through. When we get there, 
Wow. I'll be coming back to celebrate with you for sure. Um, and in order to get there, all of us need to be committed to moving people's hearts on these issues. So thank you for all you do. Uh, and thank you for your patience with me. And uh, I'll try to answer some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation, please. Last month, we had Richard Reeves here uh, from Brookings Institutions, and we talked about economic mobility. I'm glad that you touched uh, on that topic there. I want to thank you and this for trying to do your part sure. in, in helping you. our communities. Thank you. you know, 34 years ago, I lived in downtown Indianapolis, 1985. And right at 5.10, 5.15, you could not see a car on the road. Uh, there were only one or two restaurants, some of you know that. Uh, but now, this is a different type of uh, downtown. I, I suspect that's what's happening around mm -hmm. the country. Yep. So what's happening to the, to the displaced? Are we moving? What are you doing? Has yeah. your strategy yeah. changed? Displacement is a huge risk of development everywhere. Um, and so we are attempting to be an agent that helps people remain in their places to reap the benefit of that prosperity. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the strategies I mentioned was uh, this strategy in D.C. where we've got the landlords having to give first right of refusal to the tenants. But we also have products that are about working with nonprofits, for example, and financing them to acquire these properties, to keep them affordable. Um, we have products that are about working with businesses, many of whom are renting. Right. Uh, to help them buy their buildings and stay in those buildings as the property values but go But given up. your statistics that you shared, uh, you know, renters may not have the money to buy that, even though they have the first uh, right of, I guess, refusal. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, what, that's where organizing comes in. That's okay. also where philanthropy and others come, right, to, play. come to play. Absolutely. I have so many questions in the interest yeah, of I time. Yeah, I talked longer than I was supposed to. No, 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 to. that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> I want to ask you one question only, my sure. last question. Sure. If there is one thing that we need to remember from your talk as we leave in just a couple of minutes, what would that one thing would be for us to remember? Look, I think if you just remember one thing, um, the most important asset in every community is its people. And the question is, what can you do to ensure that your people have opportunities? Mm -hmm. That's the thing to think about. That's where I think we begin and end and journey right. to. It's all about what do the people need to thrive? Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you said that we shouldn't share with other 34 communities or cities, <laughs> but I, w I forgot to mention, and I'm going to mention it here, that uh, uh, the program today will be at uh, economicindiana.com. Uh, oh, I'm in for trouble. For everyone to, to watch around I was the... just joking, Boston. Right. <laughs> well, I want to thank good. you. Before we finish, I want to let you know how... Uh, what an honor has been to serve as the president of Economic Club and, and to moderate these sessions. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon and a great summer. We'll see you next year where I will be sitting in. Thank you. Nice to be with you.